This morning's reading can be found in Luke chapter 18, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is the word of the Lord. This Wednesday at Home Group, we were discussing a little bit about how easy it is to become lethargic in prayer, to give in to apathy, and therefore to give up on prayer. And as time passes by in lockdown, there's a weariness that comes over us that also affects our spiritual life, and it affects our prayer life. It's my hope that uh, this sermon from 2018, that the Lord will use it both to increase our desire to pray and increase our time in prayer. So let's pray together. Lord, what a privilege that you should invite us as children before their Father. You, the Lord of all creation, promise us to hear our prayers and answer them according to your will. Please grow our faith so that we might ever increase in our dependency upon you. Amen. Okay, what's this uh, a picture of? It's someone um, trying to jump start a car. So the battery is dead and they're trying to get some life into it. You might think, oh, why are you asking such simple questions? But I've been out at least twice to members of the congregation to help them jump start a car. Um, because they were putting their wives in all sorts of strange places, but I won't mention who it was. Uh, what about, what's this a picture of? It's someone uh, administering the um, defibrillator. The heart has stopped, and they're trying to get it pumping um, again. Now, why do I share these um, two pictures um, with you? Well, the reason I've done it is because I think... Uh, that sometimes, and um, this is what believers think that their prayer life uh, needs. We think our prayer life is um, dying um, or long dead, and that we just need some kind of boost, some kind of spark, um, some jump start or um, some shock, <laughs> and that we'll get it going um, again. Does that strike a chord with um, you? Well, it does with me in regards to and how I feel about my prayer life sometimes. Now, it's not often um, that Jesus reveals up front the meaning of a, a parable, but here he um, does, so it would have been hard to get this one um, wrong, although many have, I think. You see, we don't need to dig um, too deep to understand the purpose. It's clearly stated, verse 1, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. If that's not what you hear by the end of the sermon, <laughs> then I've not got it right. The King James Version puts it like this, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. And the English Standard Version translates it as, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So Jesus knew full well that his followers would find it difficult to keep on praying, and that the temptation of their hearts would be to give up, um, to faint, <laughs> to lose heart um, under the pressure. And so I read verse 1, and of course then the immediate question you ask is, how does the parable that Jesus speaks 
help disciples like them and us to keep praying and not give up? That's the question, isn't it? Simples, as we would say. So let me give you a quick bio of the two characters in the story. This is what we find out about the judge. Uh, he didn't fear God. He didn't respect uh, men. He didn't care about the widow. He was unwilling to help at the start. Uh, and he was unjust, verse 6. That's what we find out about the judge. What about the uh, widow? She had an adversary. She couldn't solve her own problem. She was persistent. She knew what she needed. And in the end, she got what um, she wanted. That's the two um, characters in the story. So I want, what I want to do um, this evening is simply share four things that I think we're meant to get um, from the parable um, that will enable us to keep on praying and not to lose heart, so that actually our prayer life won't need jump-starting or CPR, because we'll just have to be able to keep going under the pressure. So here's number one. Keep praying and do not lose heart, because your God is not like the unjust um, judge. As I read the parable, I thought to myself, why would Jesus choose the unjust judge as a character in the story to represent God? If you think about it, there are clearly so many other options that Jesus could have chosen and stories he could have told in order to represent God and about praying to him. And yet we know the answer, don't we, deep within our hearts? Because we know from our own experience why Jesus chose the unjust judge. Because if we're honest, that's how we're tempted to view God when we feel despair, or when things start to get hopeless and things toughen up. When we're hopeless, we start to think, oh, God doesn't care. He doesn't hear my cries. We think that he turns a deaf ear to us. So to speak, the battery of our faith gets drained by the cold circumstances surrounding our lives. And at that point, we just start to think that God is just like the unjust judge. <laughs> and we're going to need some kind of kickstart if we're going to really pray to him again. And so Jesus tells this parable, actually, so that the disciples then and we now can be assured that our God is not like the unjust judge. Look how Jesus puts it in verse 7. He says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night. Jesus says, look, I'm painting a contrast here. You've got to get there. It's a big contrast, a stark um, difference. If this judge here, who has no compassion um, for this woman, but for his own selfish reasons will give the widow justice, will not God, the loving, compassionate one, give you justice? Of course he will. But it's difficult, isn't it? Let's be honest, it's difficult to trust God when we're hard-pressed. Difficult to trust God when things seem hopeless. Difficult to trust God and keep praying to him when life is just getting tougher and tougher. And Jesus says, look, I want you, my disciples, to know that... Our Father is more willing to hear our prayer than we are to pray it. That God is more ready to answer our prayer than we are to ask it. So what Jesus is trying to do here is trying to drive out of the minds of the disciples and the uh, early followers any idea that God is anything remotely like this unjust judge. No matter how tough it gets, and it's going to get tough for the disciples in the first century, but no matter how tough it gets, and no matter how many prayers you utter up and are seemingly unanswered, God is not like the unjust judge. I know that wrong thoughts creep in. They creep into my mind all the time. Jesus knew that wrong thoughts would creep in. This is why he gave this parable as the antidote. See, we think God is up on his throne and is indifferent to our suffering. That he's no longer interested in us. That he's overlooked us and we keep praying, Lord, for 
people in uh, Iran or uh, India, we keep praying for suffering Christians around the world. And what's going on? What happens? And Jesus says, hold up. Your God is not like the unjust judge. So keep praying and do not lose heart. But the second thing we're meant to draw out of the parable is to keep praying and do not lose heart because you are not like the widow. You are not like the widow. Now, I know probably that one's a bit more shocking because we think, well, I I I thought we were supposed to be like the widow. Isn't the widow given an example to follow in persistent prayer? Yeah, we'll come to that. But we must recognize that just as God is not like the unjust judge, we're not like the widow. What do I mean by that? Well, we're in a very different position to that of the widow, aren't we? Did you notice that? When we're despairing, we come before God as if we occupy the same position as the widow before the judge. We think, well, if I just come before God, in fact, I can just <clears throat> kind of twist his arm. Uh, if I can just keep coming, Mary, I'll wear him um, down. Then he'll listen to me. Then he'll hear my cries for justice. But that's not the way it is, is it? The widow had no relationship with the unjust judge. He made sure of that. The widow had no position of standing by which she could get a hearing before the unjust judge. But that's not the case with us, is it? Just look down what Jesus says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? There's the key. We're not widows with no standing. We're chosen ones, beloved by God. He has set his love upon us before the foundation of the world. You don't come before God as an insignificant um, widow who doesn't care uh, anything about you like with the unjust judge. No, you come before your father, you approach him as a chosen one, a child adopted into his family through our Savior Jesus Christ. And therefore, God is attentive to our prayers. He hears our cries for justice. By the way, this is what the doctrine of election is for. Here it is, the doctrine of election here in Luke 18, not so that we can argue about it, but so when all the lights go out, when our lives seem to get very dark indeed, you know that God hears you. Because you're a child. You're not like the widow. So that we know that when we lift up our voices in prayer, it never bounces off the floor of heaven back down to earth. No, it reverberates round the heavenly throne room and God silences the singing of the angels because he's attentive to the prayer of his children. And so, we keep on praying and we do not lose heart. Here's number three. Keep praying and do not lose heart because there is no question about how it all will end. That's Jesus' point in verse um, 8, isn't it? He's equating the full answer of his people's cries for justice in the midst of their hopelessness and despair uh, with his return as judge. It's like Jesus says to his followers, look, don't you understand that the very purpose of my second coming is to set everything right for you believers, you chosen ones. The final answer to all your cries for justice and all the cries of, for justice throughout the centuries resides in the return of Jesus Christ. It's interesting language, isn't it, that he used. He says, will he keep putting them off? He will give justice quickly. He will give justice quickly. Now, I know that many of you are thinking probably what I was thinking, that 
If I had to wait 2,000 days for something that I was expecting, I wouldn't ever view that as quick. So if 2,000 years <laughs> has passed, that doesn't seem very quick to us, does it? And believe me, we in sort of 2,000 years on are not the first people to start thinking that, are we? Some of the apostles hadn't got a gray hair on their head before people were saying, well, where is this coming of Jesus? Happened in the first century. This happening within 10 to 20, 30 years after Jesus had ascended. How do we know this is the case? Because Peter addresses it in his letters. He says, scoffers were saying, where is this coming he promised? Remember how Peter answered them? But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Jesus wants his people to know that the just judge has heard their prayers, and he set a day that will bring about the most glorious answers to all those cries for justice. Let me tell you, friends, I know it's difficult when you pray and you, things are going on in your life and they don't seem to be put right, we continue to pray for things that are happening to the church around the world and it seems to get worse. There are things you bring before the Lord and it's hard to discern any kind of answer <laughs> with the eyes, natural eyes that we have. Your prayers go up to God and you fear that the answers never come down. And Jesus gives this parable and says, no, the answers will come down because I'm coming down. And when I come down, every prayer that has been uttered for justice will be answered. And all things will be put right. So keep on praying and do not lose heart. Here's the fourth um, thing. Keep praying and do not lose heart because when the Son of Man comes, you want to be found with faith. Jesus ends with a question. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? He's saying that when I return, will I find people looking for my coming, prayerfully waiting for my return? Will I find people with faith, trusting me, expressed in and through persistent prayer? I knew this, but this this week has shook me because we often excuse prayerlessness in the Christian life. And yet here, I hope you'll see as I do this last point, that prayerlessness is faithlessness. Let's carry on. Trials, tribulations, and testings will come our way, but no believer in Christ can escape that, can escape those trials and tribulations. The question is whether we'll be able to stand up under them, using the weapon God has given us, the weapon of prayer. You see, the way to be ready for Christ's return is to have faith. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? You must have faith. That's how you're to be ready. And the way to maintain faith is through persistent prayer. That's why the parable is given. So I'm going to say this next line twice. I've constructed it in order to get to the heart of the parable. If you're writing anything down, write this down. If you want to be motivated in your prayer, write this line. Prayer is one of the primary expressions of faith. And where prayer has dried up, you will find that faith has withered up. Therefore, Jesus will not find faith in you when he returns. Do you understand that? Prayer is one of the primary expressions of faith. And where prayer has dried up, you will find a faith that has withered up. And so Jesus will not find faith in you when he returns. Jesus really does want his followers to have a, a tenacious faith. 
a grasping hold faith, a never giving up faith, a clinging to faith. This parable is meant to be read within the context of chapter 17. And in chapter 17, Jesus gives early warnings for the coming destruction of Jerusalem. As I said, the disciples were going to experience in the first century great suffering, great injustice for the cause of Christ. And Jesus is rightly concerned that his disciples will not have that steadfastness, that fortitude to keep on praying and never give up. Persistent prayer is a great instructor, instructor in the school of Christian growth. Here's the thing that discovered, and it's one of those twists in the tale. It's not that persistent prayer changes God, but that it changes us. <laughs> That's what the parable is telling us. It's not that it changes God, but it changes us. How so? It purifies our motives. It forces us to confront our hopelessness and helplessness and hold and cling on to Jesus. It distinguishes within us deep-seated desires from fleeting whims. It makes us ready to receive God's answer. It humbles us before God and gets our will in line with God's will so that God gets all the glory. Persistent prayer strengthens faith. So keep on praying and do not give up. Let me conclude and draw things together. Brothers and sisters, I'm fully aware um, that sometimes we get ourselves into the situation where uh, we feel like prayer is leaving a messenger on God's phone uh, only for him never to get back. That's how we feel, don't we? We get ourselves into that situation. That's why many of us are not praying as we um, should. I think that's part of the reality of Christian discipleship that Jesus recognized would be there, and so he gave us this parable and anticipated it, that we would feel like that Leaving messages, but God doesn't get back. However, according to this parable, prayer is not leaving a message on a phone. Prayer is a life jacket to keep us afloat during times when we experience the injustices of the turbulencies of this life as a Christian. It is persistent prayer that helps us to keep our head above water so that we can always keep looking for Christ's return and making sure that we don't go under. Jesus wanted his disciples then and us now to know that God is not like the unjust judge. We mustn't view him that way. If we view him that way, our prayers will dry up. And he wanted us to know that we're not like the widow. We're dearly loved children, and that's how we must view ourselves, and that will encourage us for our prayers to rise up. And he wanted his followers to hear the parable and be assured that the answer to all our prayers will come because Jesus is indeed returning. So we must maintain faith expressed in prayer, never giving up, not growing faint, not losing heart. Because like the persistent widow, our persistent faith will pay off in the end. Let's pray. Lord, we recognize that often when we talk about prayer, there's a lot of um, guilt, um, a lot of shame about our prayerlessness. Lord, and I ask that through this parable and the teaching of your word this evening that it won't be shame and embarrassment that less rests upon us, but excitement, encouragement, comfort, and joy that we can come before you a loving 
Father, knowing that all our prayers relating to your will, relating to and the proclamation of the gospel, the advance of your kingdom are all heard, all our cries that rise up about the injustice that Christians face will be answered at the return of Christ. And then our persistent prayer, our tenacious faith that has hold fast to Christ throughout this life will pay off when we see him return in glory and he embraces us and takes us home. Amen.